Okay, so let's look at the directions for number one. It says solve and express your answer in interval notation. Remember that means that we want something at the end that has um, brackets or parentheses with intervals that are true for our inequality. So starting with E, and all of these, by the way, that have fractions are the chart method. So I'm just going to create extra room on this um, Word document as we go. So for E, this is one where we have 4x minus 1 over 2x plus 3 is greater than or equal to 3. So we need to work on getting this with a 0 on the right side first. Okay, why is my pen not working? There we go. So I would first subtract the 3 over. Let's make this a little bit thinner. There we go. So that will be 4x minus 1 over 2x plus 3 minus, I can write this as 3 over 1, and that would then be greater than or equal to 0. We would want to get a common denominator, so I'm going to multiply this fraction right here by a 2x plus 3 on top and bottom, because that's the denominator of the other fraction. Then we are going to distribute that negative 3 to both parts there. So this will be 4x minus 1 minus 6x minus 9 over 2x plus 3 is greater than or equal to 0. And this would be negative 2x minus 10 over 2x plus 3 is greater than or equal to 0. So that's our first part of this problem is just getting this all set up so that we have 0 on one side and that we have a clean fraction without any separation between the two parts. So we had to get that common denominator. Your next piece is you're going to list out what are the zeros and the undefined values. Remember the zeros come from the top and that you could pull out a negative 2 here. It just makes the problem easier to just leave it as it is though. So negative 2x minus 10 equals 0. We would say add the 10 over, so x equals negative 5 is a 0 from the top. We also need to know where the bottom equals 0 even though it's undefined because remember that's also a critical value for this fraction. Essentially a critical value just means the place where your sign could possibly change from positive to negative. And so if we set 2x plus 3 equal to 0, solve we get that our other critical value is negative 3 halves. Just as a, a result of remember talking about this before, you have to remember that anything on the top obeys the inequality. So this has got an equal to, so this guy will actually have a closed circle on it. Anything in the bottom is always open because you do not want to equal 0 in the bottom. So this guy is going to be open. Once you have your critical values labeled, and you know if they're open or closed, that's when you want to make the chart. So we come over here and we make a number line. We place these from least to greatest, so negative 5 actually is the smaller one because negative 3 halves is negative 1.5. Uh, we need to pick a test value for each region. Well, you might want to um, you might want to first label what the intervals are because that will help you pick your test value. So this was a closed point this was an open point. So this is negative infinity to negative 5 with a bracket. Bracket negative 5 to negative 3 halves with a parentheses and negative 3 halves to positive infinity. Your test value has to exist inside that interval. So this would have to be smaller than negative 5. So I'd say negative 6, something between negative 5 and negative 1.5, maybe negative 2. Bigger than negative 1.5, we could use 0. You take each of those numbers and you plug them into the factors from the top and the bottom of that fraction. And our hope is that we come out greater than or equal to 0. So if we plug in negative 6, negative 2 times negative 6 would be positive 12. Minus 10 would be positive 2. So that's a positive sign. Negative 6 times 2 is negative 12. Plus 3 is negative 9. So that's a negative sign. A positive times a negative is a negative. And even though this is a fraction, it's a positive divided by a negative is still a negative. Multiplication and division follow the same rules um, from, for signs. And then negative 2 times negative 2 
would be positive 4, 4 minus 10 would be negative 6, 2 times negative 2 would be negative 4, uh, plus 3 would be negative 1, a negative times a negative is a positive. If you plug in 0, you just get the numbers, so this would be a negative 10 and a positive 3, and that makes an overall negative. We were looking for, remember, greater than or equal to 0, so that means we want the plus case. So my final answer should be negative 5 to negative 3 halves, bracket on the left, and a parentheses on the right. Now before I do anything else, let's open this one up to questions if anybody needs something. If you're good, you can just tell me you're good in the comments. Does anybody have any questions or concerns about this problem? Are we okay? All right. I don't hear any dissent, so we will move on to F. Oh, stop moving that. There we go. So F is similar, um, except this time it's already set up for us with the, the zero part. So we just need to make sure that we can factor it. So for F, and by the way, I'll save this document as well. Um, I usually save it as a PDF afterwards and post it to Blackboard. So um, if you don't get everything copied down as we go, just remember you can look there um, after this is over. So x squared plus 8x plus 16, we need to factor that. So factors of 16 are 4 and 4, it looks like that would work. So that would be an x plus 4 and an x plus 4. On the bottom, we need factors of 16 that make negative 10, so that would be a minus 8 and a minus 2. We just need to list our zeros and our undefineds. This one's pretty easy on top. It, it happens twice. You just need to list it once, but it's a negative 4. And this does not have the equal to bar, so this will actually be open because this does not have the equal to bar. And then we have a positive 8 and a positive 2 would make zeros in the bottom, and the bottom is always open. So then we take those numbers, we place them from least to greatest. So negative 4, open, 2, open, and 8, open. We write our intervals. And remember, you just write from number to number. And the endings are always the infinities. This is positive infinity. Oh, okay. Pick a test value for each region. So less than negative 4, I would use negative 5. Between negative 4 and 2, I would go with 0. Between 2 and 8, maybe 4. And bigger than 8, maybe 9. Plug in every factor here. So the x plus 4 must be listed twice in your testing part because it was twice in your problem. And this time we hope that our overall final answer is less than zero. So we're looking for negative signs. So negative plus uh, 5 plus 4 would be negative 1. That happens again. Negative 5 minus 8 would be negative 13. Negative 5 minus 2 would be negative 7. Four negatives multiplied together is a positive. Uh, zero plugged in would just give you the sign of the constant. So we get plus, plus, negative, negative, so that's also a positive overall. Then 4 plus 4 is positive, positive, 4 minus 8 is negative, 4 minus 2 is positive, so that's an overall negative, and then the 9 will give us a positive all the way down for each of those, which is an overall positive. We were looking for less than 0, which means we definitely want this region. Anytime you have two pluses or two minuses back to back, you should always check the number in between. If it's open, you don't need to do anything. If this number was closed, we would need to include it as part of our solution. But since this has not got the equal to, this situation only means that this is the answer. So from 2 to 8. Any questions on that one?
Are we okay? And I believe we just had one more in the section number one. It was G, I believe. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to move to another page for this one. I'm trying to keep this organized so you guys can go back and read through it later if you need to. Okay, for G, you need to get everything on one side again. So that's going to require us to do subtraction because this fraction is positive right there. So that would be 3 over x plus 2 minus 2 over x minus 1 is greater than 0. To get a common denominator, we need to multiply each fraction by what the other one has as a denominator. So I'm going to use x minus 1 in the first fraction and x plus 2 in the second fraction. That would create the numerator of 3x minus 3. Be careful here, this negative gets to go with that 2 when you distribute. So that's negative 2x minus 4. The bottom is now your combined denominators. We combine stuff on the top and it looks like it comes out to a nice x minus 7 on top. So my zeros are the top numbers, which would be just 7. That's the only thing that could create a zero on top. And the undefined would be a positive 1 and a negative 2. And again, everything's going to be open in this problem because the bottoms are always open and the top does not have the equal to attached to it. So we just put these in order. Try to go through this one a little quicker since we've done a couple of these. Negative 2, 1, and 7. This would be negative infinity to negative 2 since everything's open. It's all parentheses. Open, open, open. And then we need three different factors to check. X minus 7, X minus 1, X plus 2. We hope that this will come out greater than 0 at the end. I'm going to pick negative 3, um, 0, 2, and 8. All those have to be in those intervals. Plugging them in, negative 3 minus 7 is negative 10. Negative 3 minus 1 is negative 4. Negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. Three negatives make a negative. 0 just gives you the sign of the numbers because 0 would be nothing. So negative, negative, positive. So that's an overall positive. 2 minus 7 is negative. 2 minus 1 is positive. 2 plus 2 is positive. That's an overall negative when we multiply. And 8 plugs in and gives me 3 positives. So that's an overall positive. Final answer needs to be greater than 0, so it'll be the two positive regions. So my final answer would be negative 2 to 1 unioned with 7 to infinity. And that completes that one. Okay, so before we move on to the next question type, are we okay with these chart methods? Um, especially, it looks like you guys were struggling with the, the rational ones the most. So we did three types of those. So just let me know. If you don't say anything, I'm assuming you're good. <laughs> Okay, so Levy wants to know how to tell if it's open or closed. You go by, so on the top, you obey the actual inequality. So on top, you look at the inequality. If the inequality has uh, a, just a less than, you'd be open, but if it was a less than or equal to, you'd be closed on that specific number. On the bottom, you don't ever want to equal zero, so that's why the bottom ones are always open. So Bottom will always, 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 always be open. Top depends on if you have an equal to bar or not. That's that's the only time you can get a closed is if you have the equal to bar, and it would only apply to the stuff on top. Does that clarify that? Is that okay? Okay. All right, so let's go back up to our list and see what is next. 
So we have done one E, F, and G. So we're going to look at 2D next, and then we'll go to the threes. Oh, that was way too fast. Okay, so this was 2D, I believe, that I was asked about. Okay, so the first thing with absolute values is that you have to make sure it's completely isolated on the left side by itself first. So when you look at this one right here, this has got a plus 9 and a times 2 out front. So our first step is to minus the 9 over. So that gives me a negative 6 over here. Then we divide everything by 2 because you're not ready to do anything to get rid of the absolute value until this is isolated. And then when you get to this point, when you have an isolated absolute value, an inequality sign, and then a number on the right side. Once you get here, the first thing you need to check is see if this is now a positive or a negative number out over on the right side. If it's positive, you can solve the problem. If it's negative, you don't need to solve the problem because this is going to either make sense or not. An absolute value always comes out positive, no matter what you plug in. Is a positive bigger than a negative? That is always true. A positive is always bigger than a negative, so that means that would be negative infinity to infinity. No matter what number on the number line I plug in, if I say 5,000, 3 times 5,000 would be 15,000, plus 2 would be 15,002. The absolute value of that is a positive 1, and it's still bigger than negative 3. I could plug in negative 1 million if I want. No matter what, the absolute value part turns it back into a positive, so this will always be true. If this had been a plus 3, we would have gone on and solved the problem, like in part B where you have a plus 5 when you get to the end. So any questions on that one, or are we okay? Okay, um, we have a question about clarification of our part C. If you solve this one for the isolation first, because this one's similar, you would subtract the 10 over and get negative 4. You divide by 5 and you get negative 4 fifths over here. This is the same kind of setup. The difference is this is now a less than. A positive, because remember this guy is always going to come out positive, is never less than a negative. That is never true. So that's why this one is no solution. So it really depends on if there's a negative on the right side, the way you answer depends on if it's a greater than or a less than, because that's the only way you're going to know. Is that okay? Okay, it looks like, was that your question? Okay. Okay, that puts us into problem number three, which is the midpoint and the distance stuff. And remember we told you you have to memorize the formulas for those. So let's just make sure we know them. So for the midpoints, and I'm so sorry guys, I do have a cold. <laughs> so I'm sorry if you're listening to me sound horrible. Um, this is x1 plus x2 divided by 2 because you're trying to average or cut in half. So you're trying to find a median, essentially. So x1 plus x2 divided by 2, y1 plus y2 divided by 2. So you add your x's, cut them in half. You add your y's, cut them in half. That's how we find the midpoint. So this would be negative 1 plus 3, cut that in half. 18 plus negative 22, cut it in half. That is 2 over 2 and negative 4 over 2. So that would be an overall answer of 1, negative 2. So that would be the midpoint for those two points. Then we want to find the distance. You find the distance by essentially doing Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem, remember, is um, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. The difference is we want to solve for c, so that's why our formula has a square root in it. So it's d equals the square root of, this is the length, 
of the side of the triangle that is horizontal, so that's this change in x squared, plus the other leg of the triangle, which would be the change in the y values squared. So essentially it's change in x squared plus change in y squared under a square root. So it's essentially the Pythagorean theorem that goes along with this picture right here. So here's x1, y1, here's x2, y2, this is d, that's the distance, and we have created a, uh, a right triangle essentially. This side down here is the x is subtracted, and this height is the y subtracted. So that's a squared plus b squared <laughs> equals c squared. That's where this formula comes from. So we're going to plug in what we know. So this would be 3 minus negative 1 squared plus negative 22 minus 18 squared. That's going to be a plus plus, so that's actually 4. And that is negative... 40, yeah, so then we square those, that would be 16, you have to square them first, you cannot take the square root first, and you can't do anything until you've gotten a single number, and this would be 1600, so this is the square root of 16, 16, <laughs> which does have a perfect square that goes into it, I believe that would be 16. So 16, 16 divided by 16 is 101. So this is 16 times 101, which would be 4 on the square root of 101 if we reduce it. And you do not go to, to decimal. Um, on the test, it will say leave it as an exact distance, which means you go reduced radical. Are we okay with that one? All right, not hearing anything from anybody, so I'm guessing we're okay. <coughs> let, let me know you're okay every once in a while, that you're still alive. <laughs> All right, and then that gets those two or three off of our list. Just trying to keep track of where we're at time-wise. So now we want to look at 4A and B, and then we'll go to 5C. That is so slow now. Okay, so for A and B, um, this is that problem we did in class where you had to create a arbitrary point. Essentially, you're still using the distance formula, but they gave you the actual answer to the distance. You have to figure out one of the points. So it says on this first one, find all the points on the y-axis. That means that the missing point is a y-intercept which a y-intercept always looks like a zero and then some number for y. The distance is 5, and the other point is negative 2, 3. So if we let this be negative 2 and 3 are my x1 and my y1. 0, y are my x2 and my y2. And d equals 5. Then we plug this into the formula. This would be d It's 5 equals the square root of x2 minus x1, so that'd be 0 minus negative 2 squared, plus y2, which is y, minus y1 squared. We want to work it out, so this would be negative 2 squared, so that's going to be just a 4, and this would still be a y minus 3 squared. I would not FOIL that, leave it alone. Because the next thing I would do is I would square both sides to get rid of that square root. So I'm going to raise both sides to the squared power. On the left, that's going to give you a 25. On the right, it just gives you the interior. So this would be 4 plus y minus 3 squared. Subtract the 4 over. So this would be 21 equals y minus 3 squared. And as a final step, we'd want to take the square root to get rid of this. But remember, when you take a square root yourself, you have to write plus or minus. And then we just add over the 3. So y equals 3 plus or minus the square root of 21. Now that's what y equals. You were asked to find points. 
So your final answer actually has to be an ordered pair. But the, we already know what it looks like. It's a zero and then the number. So one case would be zero, three, minus the square root of 21. The other case would be zero, comma, three plus the square root of 21. And that would be the format we would want the answer in. Is that one okay? Because the next one's the same process, but just written a little differently. Are we okay? Okay, Ashley's good. Anybody else still alive? Okay. So this next one, pretty similar. Um, I do have a follow-up. Parker, that's, that's based on one of the questions in a minute. It does not matter to me, no. Just answer your question. All right. And it looks like everybody else is good. Okay. So for B part, um, I don't know if it's because of time. I'm looking at how much time we have left. I'm just going to get you the, the bare bones of how to set this one up. If I think if we do that, you should be able to work it out for the review. This one just says all points on the x-axis. So instead of 0, y, you write x, 0. It has to be an x-intercept. So you do the same process here that we just did, except you're just using a different point. So you'll be solving essentially for x at the end. And then this still has a distance of 5. Is everybody okay with that one, or do I need to work that one all the way out? Would that be okay just leaving you with that as your setup? Because then this guy would be x2, y2 down here. Okay. So let's, since I don't have anybody saying they absolutely have to see that one, let's do 5C. 5C is writing the equation of a perpendicular line. Um, this is always uh, one that I see students struggle with on the test. I think it's just because they want to use this equation a lot and do something with it. The only thing this equation is good for is slope and that's all you want from it. So you take, the first thing you do is you find what we call the old slope. And that comes from the equation that they give you. The only way to find that is to solve this for y equals mx plus b essentially. Um, well there's other ways but the quickest way. So we would subtract over the 8x and then divide everything by 3. So my old slope, which I call mold, is negative 8 thirds. Your second step is to say, okay, what do I want to do with this? I want to write something that is perpendicular. So we want a slope that is perpendicular. Remember that means that they need to hit at 90 degrees and they're also heading in opposite directions essentially. So one's a positive slope and one's a negative slope and one's a reciprocal of the other. So this would be positive 3 over 8. That would be our slope. The last thing, and the thing that I think most students miss, is that you have to use the point they gave you. If you don't use that, you didn't do anything. So for step three, you take your point and your new slope. Ah, that's not how you spell slope. And you plug them into point slope, which you do have to have memorized. We don't provide any formulas on this test. So this would be y minus 2 equals 3 eighths x minus negative 9, which will actually be plus 9. I usually try to clear out that fraction and make my life easier. Uh, my final answer needs to be in all three formats. So here's point slope. So there's the first format. Check. Um, I'm going to multiply by 8 everywhere to try to get rid of that fraction. By the way, we won't ask you for point slope on the test. We'll just ask you for slope intercept or standard general form. They use general um, in our textbook sometimes. So remember that standard also means general, in case you forgot that. Um, so slope intercepts say I multiply everything by 8. 
that clears out this fraction on the right side. We distribute to both sides. Um, I actually go to general first because it actually makes more sense from this point. So in general format, the X goes over to the left side and that 16 would go over to the right side, which means it would get added. So that would make that 43. Um, you could leave it like this, and this would be general. I know sometimes they get ticky about the negatives, so you could change all the signs so that the leading coefficient is positive on the test. If you get either one of these with correct numbers, I'm happy. Um, and then for slope intercept, you would need to divide everything, uh, move the 3x back over first, and then divide everything by the 8. So this would be y equals 3 eighths x plus 6. So that would be the slope intercept. And this guy was point slope. So that would be three different formats for writing that same equation. Are we okay with that one? Okay. I believe six was also on our list, so I'm just going to, without going back up to the top, I'm just going to do this one since it's right below it. This was the perpendicular bisector problem, which the big difference is you still do need a slope that is perpendicular, but bisector means you need the midpoint. So the keyword here to know how to do this is the perpendicular and the bisector. Both of those are telling you to do certain things. So let's take care of the word perpendicular first. Um, so we're going to find our old slope by using the point that they gave us. They gave us two points. So this would be negative 4 minus 22 over 8 minus 10. That is negative 26 over negative 2, which is positive 13. So my perpendicular slope, since this is 13 over 1, would be negative 1 over 13. So that's going to be the slope that I use. For the bisector part, bisector means midpoint. So we need to take the midpoint of this point. So we add the x's together, we cut them in half. We add the y's together, we cut them in half. That is 18 over 2 and 18 over 2. Just happened to be the same number twice, so that's 9, 9. Now you take the midpoint and this perpendicular slope together, and that's what we use for point slope. So y minus 9 equals negative 1 over 13 times x minus 9. I would multiply both sides by 13 to clear out that fraction. Just realize you still have to distribute that negative 1. So 13y minus 117, is that right? Double check myself. No, I did not type that in right. What was the number? Uh, 13 times 9. Yeah, 117. And then we distribute the negative 1 on the other side. That makes that a negative x and a positive 9. And we do want this in general or standard form. So I'm going to move the x over to the right by adding it. I'm also going to add the 117 over and add that to the 9. And that would give me 1... 26. So that would be my final answer on that one. Are we okay with that one? Because the perpendicular bisector is usually the one that's the toughest out of all of the equations. Are we okay? We good? I had a question. Sure. Um, does the bisector means the midpoint, right? That just yes, because when in geometry, 
a bisector always means the middle or the halfway point of something. So when you talk about a segment, the halfway or middle point would be the midpoint for us. If we were talking about an angle, like in geometry, it would be a ray. It would be something that cuts the angle in half. So for us, in a segment, it has to be the midpoint. That's the only way you can do a bisector. Is that, is that okay? Okay. Anybody else want to interject a question or anything? Okay, pretty quiet room, so let's go up and see what else is on our list. Okay, so we've done 4A and B. We've done 5C and we've done 6. So now we're moving down to 8B and 9A next. Oh, this thing is nuts. Okay, so 8... 8, 8, 8, where's 8? 8, 8B. Okay, this is a good one. This asks us to graph the parabola. Okay, so remember when we told you on the test when you're asked to graph a parabola, there's a couple things we're going to ask from you. We're going to ask you if the parabola opens up. We're going to ask you for the vertex, the intercepts, and the axis of symmetry, and then we'll make you graph it. So notice this set of directions asks for all of those things. So I'm just going to make my list. This is how it'll look on your test. You won't have to come up with this. You'll just have blanks over here to fill in. And then there'll be another graph over here for us to fill in. So to know if it opens up or down, you look at the number in front of x squared. If it's positive, you open up, which means you look like this in a parabola. If it was negative like this one, you would open down. And that means your parabola would look like this. So that's just what that means. To find the vertex, you have to use the negative b over 2a. Remember, that's the first part of the quadratic formula. So negative, negative 10, because that's our b, over 2 times a, which is 2. This is positive 10 over 4, which reduces down to 5 halves. So that is our vertex x value. To get the y value, we have to plug that into the function. So this would be 2 times 5 halves squared minus 10 times 5 halves plus 12. When you square a fraction, you square top and bottom. So that's 2 times 25 over 4. This would be minus 50 over 2 plus 12. I can reduce this 2 and this 4. So that's 25 over 2 minus 50 over 2 plus 12. That would be negative 25 over 2 plus, let's make this guy have the same fraction. So if I times it by 2 over 2, that makes that 25, uh, 24 over 2. So I'm getting negative 1 half. Now obviously you'd probably want to use your calculator for that, but just easier to show the work. Okay, to find the, so that's my vertex. It's a nasty fraction. It's 2.5 comma negative 0.5. That's where we would graph it. For the x-intercepts, you need to set y equal to 0. So that would be, I'm going to do my work over here. So we would say, okay, 0 equals 2x squared minus 10x plus 12. Try to factor it. So I'm going to pull out a 2. Factors of 6 that have same sign and make negative 5 when you add them would be a 2 and a 3. So x minus 3 and x minus 2. 2 does not give you an x-intercept because it has not got an x to it, but this will give you a 3. And this one right here will give you a positive 2. So we have two x-intercepts, 2, 0, and 3, 0, which makes sense because that's each one on each side of 2.5. The y-intercept is where you let all the x's equal 0. So essentially that just zeroes out everything up here and you're just left with the 12. And then axis of symmetry is always x equals, and it's the number of your vertex for the x spot. So that would be 2.5 or 5 halves. And we would want you to write that in fraction form. So then once you have all those pieces together, you have to graph it. So I'm going to do a rough sketch right down here at the bottom. So we have to come up with a little grid, and your grid will be for provided for you, but... Okay. 
Here's my y-intercept there at 0, 12. My x-intercepts are 2, 0 and 3, 0. And I have a very small vertex right here at 2.5, negative 0.5. So that's my vertex. And then I just draw the best parabola I can that goes through all those points. And you can also use your symmetry to get, remember, a matching point on the other side to help you draw it. Is everybody okay with this one? Because this is definitely on the test. We told you that you had four graphing types on the test, two transformations, a parabola, and a piecewise function. So this takes care of the parabola. Yes, Louise, I'm, I'm going to um, post this review and the recording that I'm making as soon as we're done with it. So all of this will be um, on Blackboard tonight. Everybody good? Okay. I believe nine... Yeah, 9A was our next one on the list, and then 10A. So we're going to go down and do 9A and 10A really quick. These should start going a little bit quicker because the heavier stuff was at the beginning in terms of the work. Okay, so for this one, who asked for 9A? Does anybody remember who asked for that one? <laughs> Might have been multiple people. Okay, Marissa, did you want to see, I mean, are, are we trying to go through all six portions or was there a specific one that you needed to see? Because this is adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and composition two different ways. I don't mind doing all six. I just didn't want to overdo it. Okay, so you want to see the F of G and the G of F. Does anybody else have a different preference? Like you want to see something else as well as those. So she wants to see essentially the last two pieces here, the five and the six. And it looks like somebody else wants to see that part as well. So let me make this a little bit larger so I have room to write. For adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing essentially is stuff we did in chapter one. You just have to know to get a common denominator. If you're adding or subtracting and multiplying is top times top, bottom times bottom. Division is multiply by the reciprocal. So at least those are things we've done before. The new thing was the composition. So let's do f of g of x, which means f with g plugged in. So remember, you take the f function and you write it, and everywhere you see the x, you actually think of the word blank. So 2 blank over blank minus 7. Inside that blank, you put the other function. So that would be the 5 over 4x. Now we want to clean this up because we want it to look like a nice, neat fraction. So if it was me, I would go ahead and try to get rid of the 4x's everywhere. This is just one big blob on top. And then on the bottom, we need to do 4x times both binomial pieces. So essentially that would cancel and leave me with a 10 because it's 2 times 5 on top. This would be a 5 and then this would be minus 28x. So that would be the composition of this. And we didn't ask you for the domain in this part, so you don't have to write the domain. If you wanted the domain, you'd have to say exclude the x from this part right here. So that would, be this, that would mean 0 couldn't be part of the solution. And you'd have to set this equal to 0 to make sure you know what the end result is. But we didn't ask you for domain. So, And then I also have a request for f over g, so I'll do that in a minute. So for the g of f, we want to do the composition the other way. So this is g with f plugged in. Separate these out a little bit. So the g function is 5 over 4x. So for us, that would be blank. In the blank, we're going to put the other function. Let's do it in blue. So we're going to put the 2x over x minus 7. 
and then this would be the same idea. We want to clear out that x minus 7. So I'm going to multiply by x minus 7 on top and bottom. Here on the bottom it cancels. So my new denominator is just 2 times 2x times 4, which would be 8x. On top I have to distribute this 5. So that'd be 5x minus 35. So that would be the composition the other way. And then I also had a request to do the division of these two. So if you're doing f over g, you just stack it essentially. So f over g, which means you put the first fraction over the second one. Now we would normally look at this part for our domain, so 7 is a problem still, 0 is a problem, 5 does not create any new problems because even though it's in this denominator, there's no x there. So there's no x on that numerator right there. So this would still have a domain of no 7 and no 0. Um, but to solve this or make it cleaner, we multiply by the reciprocals. So we do 2x, x minus 7 times 4x over 5 and that would be 8x squared over 5x minus 35. So that would be that portion. Are we okay with that? Okay, so let's see what that puts us at, because I believe we're now in the teens for questions. Goodness, there's a lot of work. Um, so we just did 9a a minute ago. Or is that the one we just did? We just did 9a. So do we still have 10a and 12 and 13? Okay, 10a, this was all talking about domain. a and c were supposed to be quick ones. Anytime, okay, so let's just go over the rules. If you have a polynomial, just a regular polynomial, your domain is all real numbers. If you have a rational, it's you just don't want the denominator to equal zero. So you have to figure out what that means. If you have a radical, there's two cases. If it's even, you need to make sure that the part underneath is greater than or equal to zero. If it's an odd root, you just say all real numbers, because odd roots can have anything underneath them. Uh, we didn't list this one in class, but it's in here. Absolute value is just like a polynomial, so it's all real numbers. So essentially, these A and C were supposed to be, you don't need to do any work. This has a cubed root, which is an odd radical. This has an absolute value, so the only two that require works are the ones that have these fraction parts in the bottom and the radicals. So if you see something like this, you're automatically to assume that it's all real numbers. Is that okay for that? Are we good? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to transpose my list a little bit lower so I don't have to keep scrolling all the way back to the top. Stop. So let's take this. No, I don't want to use the pen. Stop ink for a second. I'm going to highlight the numbers that we still have to do if it'll let me. It's not letting me. There we go. Copy down here. Just so I can save myself from having to scroll back through all this again. Okay, so right above 
number 12 is where I'll paste this. Okay, so now we're going to look at number 12. Um, nobody specified, so can I pick the one that I think will be most helpful? Does that sound good to everybody? Of course it does, right? Okay, I would focus on A. So for A part, B is a little bit harder, but like I said, on a review we always give you kind of a medium, easy, and hard situation. Usually the easy medium is is the most likely culprit. Um, sometimes the hard one will show up, but in this case I would focus on A. So this is that difference quotient thing where you're supposed to do these pieces and then divide by H and try to reduce it down. If it was me, I would always do this in pieces. I would find what is F of A plus H, and then I would find negative F of A, because that takes care of that subtraction sign, and then I would just put all of that on top and put it over H. So remember what this says is anywhere there used to be an X, you're going to replace it with a binomial. So this would be 5 and then A plus H squared minus 1. So notice that X turned into that binomial. So now we want to FOIL this out because this is being squared and it's a binomial. So this would be A plus H times A plus H. That would be 5 A squared plus AH plus another AH would be 2 AHs plus H squared minus 1. And then I would need to distribute that 5 to everything except for the 1 because remember this, sorry, my parentheses ended right here. And then for this guy, this just says take your original function and change all the signs and I also told you to change the x to an a. So that would make that negative 5a squared and a plus 1. Both of these pieces are your numerators right here. So now I'm going to plug that in to the function and I would have on top 5a squared plus 10ah plus 5h squared minus 1 minus 5a squared plus 1. I don't need to worry about that minus sign because I already took care of it. And that's all over h. If you've done this right, usually something cancels. In fact, two things cancel here. So I now have 10ah plus 5h squared over h. And both of these can be divided by h. So I would just get 10a plus one, uh, 5 with 1h left over. And that would be my final answer for that one. Are we okay with that? You could pull out the 5. You don't have to. Um, like, do you mean at the end? Like, if you wanted to factor this out and say 5 times 2a plus h, that's okay. But it's not necessary because it doesn't cancel with anything on the bottom. Usually, you just want to reduce out. And yes, Marissa, I will try to squeeze 14 in. Are we okay with this, everybody? Ah, don't need to go as far up anymore. So that was number 12. I'm going to write in 14 as a squeeze in. Okay, so let's look at 13. I have, it says A and B here, but 13 only had one part. 13 is the piecewise function. So essentially we said the best way to graph these is to just do a table of values for the three different parts. So we have an x plus 3, we have an x cubed, and we have a 4 minus x. We have a domain on each of these. Um, this is net less than or equal to negative 2, so negative 2 would be closed because you have the less than or equal to. Things that are smaller would be negative 3 and negative 4. You plug those into this function. Negative 2 plus 3 is 1. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. For the middle function, we are going from negative 2 to 2. You don't need to hit every point in between those, just hit enough so that you know what it looks like. Maybe you might want to do a 1 just to get a little shape. Um, the endpoints are both open because neither one of them have 
be equal to. We are cubing here, so negative 2 cubed is negative 8, 0 cubed is 0, 1 cubed is 1, 2 cubed is 8. And then for my last one, we're doing x is greater than 2, so 2, 3, and 4 would be numbers. Uh, it does not say greater than or equal to, so this is going to be an open circle. 4 minus 2 is 2, 4 minus 3 is 1, 4 minus 4 is 0. Once you have at least three points for each section, you want to graph this on your grid, which will be provided to you. Those are really badly spaced. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, okay. So for this first one, it's a negative two, one, and that is closed. Negative three, zero and then negative 4, negative 1. Notice this does not have any boundary on the bottom, so this goes back and down forever. That is supposed to look closed. And then the middle part, we have negative 2, negative 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And that's supposed to be open. Uh, 0, 0, 1, 1, just for shape and 2 positive 8, which is also open. So this is x cubed. It's supposed to look like a parabola heading in opposite directions. Then we have 2, 2 is open. 3, 1 is a normal point, And 4, 0. And this one is never bounded, so it keeps going in that same pattern. So this would be the graph that you would expect from that one. We okay with that? So the best thing I can tell you for piecewise is just to break it up into pieces. And other people will teach you this different ways. I had a friend who taught it by transformations and erasing things. It, it, to me, it's less complicated if you just do it in chunks. And most people like tables of values. So, okay, so that means we're going to try to squeeze in 14 really quick. Uh, is it okay if I do 14B? That's more the speed, I think, of where you should be focused. Um, so let's do this one really quick. We are trying to transform standard form into vertex form. Anytime you see something squared, you should be thinking complete the square. So to complete the square, we said, first of all, we need to think about the x parts being separated from the number. So I kind of create a blank and then since I don't want stuff over here with f of x, we create a counter blank right here. You then have to have a 1 in front to be able to do completing the square. So we're going to pull out that negative 2 out of this trinomial right here, just this piece right here. So this would be x squared minus 2x. The blank is just a placeholder so it's still a blank and then plus 5 and a blank. Once you get to this point, you can now do completing the square. So we take half of the middle term, which would be negative 1, and we square that, which is positive 1. So then you write that in inside the parentheses. So this is x squared minus 2x, let's change colors, plus 1. The problem is that you didn't really add 1, Marissa, because this was your, your question you wanted to add in you did negative 2 times a positive 1, so you actually did subtract 2. <coughs> so to counter this on the outside where I have my plus 5, I need to do the opposite of this, so I need to add 2. So we're going to do in red to show this counter. This plus 2 I'm writing is actually countering this negative 2 that's going on right here, because this guy does affect this. And then finally, your final answer is that you factor this little guy right here. So this is x minus 1 squared. And then you add or subtract what's out here. So that's a positive 7. So that would be my vertex form. The vertex, member is the opposite of the x value you see. So that would be a positive 1 and exactly what you see for the y value. So that's a positive 7. So that would be the vertex for that one. 
Okay, so that takes care of 14. I believe I had multiple questions on 15 or 16. Let me look back at my list. Ah, there we go. So that takes care of 13 and 14. So we're getting close to the end of our list. Okay, so 15 A and B and 16 A and B. Okay, so for these we're supposed to graph the following functions and write a description of the transformation from the parent. Okay, so the most important part of these is to know what the parent shape is. So for this first one right here, notice it has a squared on it. That means that this is related to regular old x squared. And I always like to draw that so I know what I'm doing. So this is 0, 0. If you square 1, you get 1. If you square negative 1, you also get 1. This is the parent. Okay. If you have a number added or subtracted inside, this means you're doing what is called a horizontal shift. Anything that happens inside, we really think do the opposite. So this is like add 4 to x, which if you think about it, that means you're moving to the right. Anything that happens outside of the parentheses means that you are uh, doing a vertical shift if it's added or subtracted at the end. And you do exactly what you see, but you do it to y. So we're going to add 5 to our y's, which means we're going to move up. So on my picture, the one that I would actually use as my solution, this is what we expect for your solution. We don't want to see the parent on here. We want to see the transformed function. So I just think about taking each of these pieces and doing these in order. So 0, 0 moves right 1, 2, 3, 4, up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So there's my 0, 0. And then negative 1, 1 moves right 1, 2, 3, 4, up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And 1, 1 would move right 1, 2, 3, 4, up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now the function has been transformed right 4 and up 5. And then the only thing really different going on with B, first of all, you do have a horizontal shift. You don't have a vertical this time, but you have a negative out front. So remember, if you have a negative, that means some kind of reflection is happening. If it's outside, you reflect over the x-axis. The reason for that is the y's have changed signs. And that's why you reflect down. This is uh, going to be left 2 this time because we're looking at a negative 2 because this is opposite of what we see in here. And then we do need to know our parent, otherwise we won't get the right shape. This is the cubed function because we see the third power there. So this is 0, 0, 1, 1, and negative 1, negative 1 because when you cube it, it stays the same sign. So I'm going to take my graph. Now, how I walk through the reflection is, I, since it's outside, I'm going to do the left two part first. I always kind of do order of operations. Okay, so 0, 0 was here. You move it left two. You're supposed to reflect it on the x-axis. It's already on the x-axis, so you can't move it anywhere else. That's the only time you don't do a reflection of a point is if it's on the axis you're trying to reflect. Um, negative 1, negative 1's right here. So we move it left 2. A reflection means you mirror it on the other side. So now it's up here instead of down below. Positive 1, 1. That's right here. We move it left 2 and then we reflect it across the x-axis which means it moves down. It just changes the sign of y. So this guy looks like this. Notice he, this was up, down, now it's down, up. Or excuse me, up, down. So down, up, and now it's up, down. So it just changes its direction and it moved it two to the left. 
do we feel okay with both of those? Because those were the only two that we were asked to do. I'm going to save this document really quick because I think it's about to have a glitch. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to work. It's doing something. There we go. Just to be safe. So let me save this to my desktop since we're about halfway through. Actually a little more than halfway through. We're almost done. Come on. Why is my computer not wanting me to save? I think I've broken word. Don't die. Huh. Let's try that again. Nope. 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 Okay. I'm going to really hope that none of this deletes and that once the video is over, I'll be able to save it. We're going to hope. <laughs> Um, so 16 A and B. Okay, these are just writing a sentence about what the transformation is. So essentially you just need to, oh, I knew that was going to happen. Bear with me for a second. We're decided to die. All right, let's see how much of it was lost. We're going to hope for the best here. Most of it's still here. Okay. Yay. It's all still there. Let me try to save that because if I will not get that lucky again. So yay. Okay. We're saved. <laughs> okay. So let's look at 16. 16 has us writing the word description for these. So it says if you have the graph uh, for f of x, explain what the transformation would be necessary to graph the following. So when we look at this, notice that you have, um, this just says f of x. That's because the parent really doesn't matter. We don't, we're not graphing it. We just want to describe what these numbers mean. So if you have a negative inside, that means you are reflecting over the um, y-axis because you're changing the signs of x. If you have a number in front, you're either stretching or compressing. Since this is a whole number bigger than 1, this would be a stretch in the y direction. And then we have the minus 5, which is a vertical shift down. So, oh, I don't know what just happened there. We just lost our equations. Hmm. Okay, that was interesting. So that is, I think I remember what that one was, but let me try to write it in. I may have to reopen this document. I don't know why words being weird all of a sudden. All right, let me just make sure I can reopen this as a new document. I think Word wants me to go to bed. <laughs> it's like, go to bed. Stop working. <sighs> Alright, let me just try to open a new version of Word. Let's see if we can do that. It is not liking me right now. Go away. I, Louise, I know that you put it up there, but I can't use my pen until, until it's stopped acting like this. I think I've broke it for real. Let's try to kill it. There we go. Okay. Let's try one more time, see if it'll open up. 
Yeah, I know that one wants me to open it, but we'll open that later. Okay. I can't cancel the test, Angel. <laughs> Good try. Okay, so now we have this back up. So this one is... If I was going to write this description, I think it didn't like it because I tried to type it. Um, I would say that this is a reflection across the y-axis, because that's the thing inside the function. I always start there first. A stretch of 2 in the y-direction. And there's other ways you can write this. This is just kind of how, as I'm talking through it. And this would be a shift down 5. And then this one, uh, the first thing I see is inside we have a plus 1, so that would be a shift left 1, because we do opposite what we see. There's a one-third in front, so that would be a compression, because it's going to be squishing it, and the y direction of one-third. And the negative out front tells me that it is a reflection across the x-axis. So that, I mean, those might not be the exact wordings that are on the answer key, but those are sufficient. Are we okay with that one now? I don't know what I did to Word, but <laughs> it didn't like me. Okay, so I don't remember what else was asked because it deleted out. Um, oh, sorry, Ashley. Do you remember what? I know I had 18 on the list. Are you good yet, Ashley? Are we okay? Okay. Um, 17, you just have to describe the transformation. That one's not too bad, just by the way. So this would be a shift right one up to, and then the, the cubed function is the wrong direction. So it looks like it reflected over the x-axis at some point. Um, so you just need to write that out. So for 18, 19, and 20, we're dealing with variation. So these actually will go pretty quick. So let's look at 18. 18 says y varies directly with the square root of x. So y varies is our equal sign. Directly means that whatever we write will be right next to our constant of proportionality, which we always call k. It's just how are we relating the two things. And then since it's direct, we put it right beside this next part. So that would be square root of x. We plug in everything we know that they give us in the second part. So this would be 6 equals k times the square root of 25. So that would be 5k. Divide by 5. So k is 6 fifths. That's part of your answer. The final part is to write that into the formula. So this would be 6 fifths square root of x. For the inverse one, the only difference is that, first of all, you write this as k over the item, because inverse means it goes on the bottom. And this is square of x, not square root, so that would be x squared. We plug in what we know for x and y, so that would be 16 squared is 256. So to get rid of this, we have to multiply both sides by 256. So this is going to be a very large K, um, 256 times 8, 2048. So that would be my K, and then my final answer would be to write that into the formula. So y equals 2048 over x squared. And then our last one is a word problem, but it's the same type of problem. So let's just walk through it. It says the maximum safe load. I'm going to call that s because they didn't give me a variable. So I'm going to make my own up. I usually, if I do that, I always write it in here. So this is going to be s. For a horizontal rectangular beam, varies jointly with the width. So that'll be w. Uh, and square of the thickness, so thickness will be T, and inversely with the length, which will be L. So I'm going to try to write this. So S equals 
jointly means there will be two things on top with the K. So K times width and square of the thickness. So that would be T squared. And inversely means the next part is going to go in the bottom, which would be length. So that's my generic formula. I plug in what I know. So it's an 8-foot beam. So that, that's the length. So 8 feet long. It will support the width, or excuse me, the, um, the pounds is the safe load. So that would be 750. That's how much it can support. If the beam is 4 inches wide, so that's my width, and 2 inches thick. So that's my thickness. So that's going to be squared. So if I use this, I should be able to find K. So this would be 4 times 4 on top, which would be a 16, which means that actually turns out to be just 2K on the other side. So that would be, what, 375, I think. 750 cut in half. It's too late for my brain. Yeah, 375. And then that would be, remember, my K. I still have some other things to do in this word problem. First of all, then we need to write the formula but they do ask a follow-up question in this problem. So here's the formula now with K as 375. So there's my formula. The final thing says, okay, let's see, where is it at? What is the maximum safe load in a similar beam if it was 10 feet long, 6 inches wide, and 2 inches thick? So this time we're doing everything except for the pounds. We don't know the safe load. So S equals 375 times the width is 6 this time. The thickness is still 2, so that will be 2 squared. And it's a 10-foot long beam. So we just need to work that out. So 375 times 6 times 2 squared, which would be 4. And then divide by 10. Looks like it will be a 900-pound load that it can hold. Okay, so we just got through everything. Yay. Any questions on that last one? All 13 of you that stuck it through to the end. You didn't it all erase from the... <laughs> Say that again? From the other... Did it all erase? Um, I think it saved. You... I'm not 100% sure. So I'm going to have to check after I cut this off um, because it kept, every time I opened the document, it was freezing. I know I saved it right before that. We're going to hope that that save held. Um, if it didn't, the video will still be posted. You will still see me work out all the problems through the video, and you can just scan through. So at least you can still get, the PDF would have just been quicker because you could just immediately find it. But if you wanted to, you can just move the fast forward through on the video because I'm going to post this to my YouTube channel. And you can just fast, and I'll link it to Blackboard. So you can just fast forward if there's something that's missing. Because it'll still show up here. This is recording everything we did, even when my work was going nuts. But um, as far as if it's saved on the PDF or not, I'm, a, I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Okay, I had one last request for 2A. Let me see what that one was. Sure, 2A is an absolute value with a less than. Um, you have to remember how to set up an absolute value. First of all, it has to be isolated. As long as it's isolated, you have to know if it's less than, you put this in the middle. If it's greater than, you have two cases, one where it's less than negative infinity and, or negative uh, whatever the number is because we're trying to go to negative infinity, and the other case would be you're trying to go to positive infinity, which means you do greater than. But A is a less than case, so essentially you put this between negative 6 and 6. We would multiply everything by 2. Uh, try to get X by itself in the middle, so subtract 3. and then divide everything by negative 2. 
which is going to change the direction of everything. So this would be 15 over 2 greater than x greater than negative 9 halves. Um, if we wrote that in interval notation, it would be negative 9 halves to 15 halves because you have to write from least to greatest instead of greatest to least. Ashley, is that okay for that one? And then I have two requests for 10b that I'll do real quick. Okay, so let me scroll down to 10b. What was 10? We skipped that one before. Okay, this one is the domain of a radical where you have a fraction inside. This is the nasty one. We are not this mean on your test. Remember I told you something more like d would be the speed that you should know, but essentially you have to set this greater than zero because, because this isn't a denominator. You cannot do greater than or equal to. So we say that the whole fraction needs to be, well, you can, but you can say greater than or equal to zero, but it only applies to the top um, because this bottom cannot be equal to zero. So this is just another chart problem because it's just like the ones we did in number one. So the zero from the top would be that x equals zero. The undefined would be that x cannot equal five. So we do a chart to figure out which intervals are going to work. The top could be closed because of the equal to. The bottom would be open. So this would be a closed circle and an open circle. So that's negative infinity to zero with a bracket, zero to five, and five to infinity. We have x and x minus five that we're checking, and we hope that the overall sign is greater than or equal to zero. Test values could be negative 1, 1, and 6. So this would be negative, negative, which makes a positive. This would be positive, negative, which makes a negative. And positive, positive, which makes a positive. So it looks like we have two regions that would work. Negative infinity to 0 with a bracket, union with 5 with a parentheses to infinity. So any of that would be okay for our domain. So because this had a fraction under a radical, that's why you had to do the chart method. Whereas in this one, you don't because the radical is only on the top. Anytime there's more complicated stuff inside of a radical, you have to usually end up using a chart. Is that okay? All right, we're at the midnight time frame. Hopefully you guys will get some sleep and get some brain to rest. Um, I will try to post some of this. I'll definitely post the video. The video was working the whole time, so we should be good there. Uh, but hopefully my PDF uh, will save for that first half. But I'll, I know this one's good, so I'll save this piece and hopefully be able to save the other one and post all that right after we get off. Okay? You guys have a good night. See you, see you tomorrow.